Let's talk VO Atlanta. You're a voice actor. You're an entrepreneur. You're a VOpreneur. Welcome to the Everyday VOpreneur Podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. Having your voiceover demos easily playable and downloadable on your website is essential. The Voice Sam Player lets you do that across any device and browser. There are also options for adding play buttons in your email signature, tracking your listens, and even putting videos in your demo player. Sign up now at voicesam.com slash markscott and receive an instant $25 credit. For full details and to claim this offer, visit voicesam.com slash markscott. The Vopreneur Podcast. Hey, it doesn't suck. Not as funny as Conan. Not as cute as Seth Meyers. Not as smart as Colbert. But he's one of us, and that counts for something. Here's Mark Scott, the original Everyday Veopreneur. Hello, and welcome to the Everyday Veopreneur podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. I'm Mark Scott, the original Everyday Veopreneur, and as always, ready to dive in with another episode giving you some actionable, practical advice that you can use to grow your voiceover business. Before we dive in, I want to take a minute to remind you that all of the episodes of the podcast are actually available at vopreneur.com, and there's a lot of good content there. Over 140 episodes, all filled with actionable, practical advice designed to help you grow your business. So check out the archives at vopreneur.com. One of my favorite places to go is VO Atlanta, and I am absolutely and completely devastated because I am not going to be at VO Atlanta this year, unfortunately due to circumstances beyond my control. But I love this conference so much. I love the way that it is designed. I love the schedule and how it's put together. I love the purpose and the vision behind the conference. And so I really wanted to have an opportunity to shine a little bit of light on it, not only so that you have a, a better understanding of how the conference came about and how it works, but also so that you've got some really actionable, practical tips on how to get the most out of the conference if you're going to go. And so I thought, what better way to get some advice on how to get the most out of VO Atlanta than talking to the man behind VO Atlanta itself? Since 2013, VO Atlanta has grown into the largest voiceover industry event. Each year, hundreds of voice actors from countries around the world descend on Atlanta for four days of wall-to-wall -wall learning from the best coaches, producers, and mentors the industry has to offer. The conference schedule offers over 200 hours of scheduled activities each year. This year, uh, VO Atlanta happening March 31st to April 3rd, 2022. And the man behind it to tell us more about it is Gerald Griffith. Welcome to the show. Hey, Mark. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's address the elephant in the room right out of the gate. 2022. <laughs> Your last year for VO Atlanta, the last year for VO Atlanta, is it both and why? What brought us here? Yes. Yes. It is both. No, it's, uh, uh, I, I honestly, I mean, it, it is my last year. Um, I've had a couple people ask about, you know, trying to continue it or something like that. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know how that part will unfold is. Not really something I'm I'm dealing with much at the moment because I've got my hands full with uh, planning the event at hand. So, um, you know, that's that's where my focus is. So what brought it on? Just 10 years and call it good enough or how, how do we get there? Well, I think I think like with a lot of things in, in life um, and, and surely you can identify with it now that you you've you know had a family and <laughs> stuff like that over the last few years. Uh, you know, life life changes and yep. you change. Uh, I, I look back sometimes at the pictures and things and, uh, you know, I, I smile a little bit when I just think of the fact that when I started the conference back in 2013 for the first time, uh, I, I was making arrangements to have my son picked up from kindergarten. And now he's a starting varsity player in high school football. That's crazy. So, <laughs> You know, so, so that gives a little perspective to just how much things have changed um, during that time period. And so, you know, you get to a place with things where I think you you just you, you step back and, and your priorities in life change. Yep. Uh, the way you value your time uh, on different things uh, changes. And I, I think it's, you know, probably 
just a maturing thing where you understand that just because you go do something different doesn't mean the thing you were doing was bad. Mm -hmm. It just means that maybe the season of you doing those things has uh, passed and um, it's time for you maybe to to move on to to some other things. Um, I, I like to think those things are better things, uh, but sometimes it's just time to to turn the page. It's crazy when you say when you when you put it into the perspective of your son. And right. that really does like I mean, for us, it's just like VO Atlanta every year. You just go to VO Atlanta every year and you don't really think about it. When you put it into that perspective, though, you realize, wow, a lot of life has passed in that time. And it does make yes. sense that priorities are going to shift and, and change for sure. Yeah, it, it does. And um, and that's not a bad thing. It's, no. it's just it's just a, a life cycle thing where mm -hmm. you, you go through different stages. And so for me, I, I feel like now is the, the right time to, uh, you know, just step away from the conference. And, uh, you yeah, know, I've gotten asked a number of times, well, what, what's next? What are you going to be doing? And I don't have a clear answer for that. And uh, initially I started trying to think, you know, well, you know, what am I going to do next? You know, try to answer that question, so to speak. And uh, I've just come to terms that you don't always have to have the next thing to move on from the first thing. <laughs> you know, you just sometimes need to be in a space where you're available for the next thing to happen. And I think that's where I am. I'm, I'm mentally at a place where I'm okay without have feeling like uh, I get out of one thing and, and all of a sudden, you know, the next week I'm into the next venture. Give yourself a chance to, to recover. So, so what you're saying is that there's not going to be VO Miami or VO LA or VO Phoenix, or I'm, I'm trying to think of warm places for a Canadian to come in March. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I I have no plans for anything like that. And, uh, and even as I was describing it a moment ago, I was thinking uh, one of the life lessons I had in, in this very same vein was when I got out of the military back in 1996, which seems like a millennial ago, millennia ago. Um, I, I was trying to be so on top of things. And I came back from Germany, uh, getting out of the military like on a Wednesday I had a job interview on Thursday, and I started a management training program on Monday. Jeez. The problem was that I didn't realize how important it was to give yourself room to decompress yeah. and shift gears. Yep. And uh, so I remember, you know, being in that management training program the, the next week or two, and, you know, they, they just, they, they there were just some things that went on that my brain was so not ready to absorb in the civilian life. Yep. <laughs> it was, and so I, I had to say, you know, look guys, I, as, I, I hate to do you like this, but I had to just step away. And it was a weird thing, but I realized I really did need to allow myself some time to just realign with w what was going on and give myself time to breathe coming out of the military. And, um, and I think this is much the same where, you know, I'm trying not to make it to where, OK, the conference is over on Sunday at 12 and Monday morning I start <laughs> somewhere else doing something different. Um, you need that space. I think you've earned a little break. I know for me, when my last radio job came to an end, I mean, I sat around for a couple of months trying to figure out wh what am I going to do next? Right. But I needed that time. There was no way I could have went out and got a job the next day. So it makes yeah. sense that you need some time to figure things out. So oh, yeah. I know in 2020, you were put in an impossible position. My heart was hurting for you every day because everything was unfolding in real time. Nobody knew anything about COVID at that point. Restrictions, regulations were changing literally minute by minute. What do you wish that folks understood about how everything went down? Because I think that people just looked at how it affected them, but nobody understands or nobody took the time to consider all of the other factors that were at play behind the decision that you had to make in, in 2020. So do you, is there anything you wish people understood about how that all unfolded? Um, I, I can honestly say there, you know, there are a thousand different uh, feelings, thoughts, emotions that I, I could attach to that time period. And the reality is, is it was such a unique event in, in all of our history mm -hmm. that it's almost unreasonable to think that anyone would have known how to handle it. You know, yep. none of our parents would have been able to coach us through this and say, Hey, you know, when the pandemic comes in your lifetime, here's how you should react. Uh, so, so I had to somewhat detach from 
trying to, to, you know, have a particular view over how people reacted. Yep. I didn't really know how to react, so I couldn't expect other people to really know how to react. And, you know, the, the lesson learned, I guess, or the experience or whatever from it was that we all have to give each other some latitude to, to deal with things as they unfold. And there's not always simple or easy answers to everything. And, um, and in my case, the, the irony was always that on one hand, I would have people who would say, hey, um, you should, you know, you should make this exception for me. And then at the same time, I would have sometimes the same people say, well, we just want to be treated fairly and, and, and just like everybody else. You know? <laughs> I would say, well, the irony is you want to be treated like everybody else, but then you want me to make an exception in the same breath. Yeah. When, when in fact I am treating you like everyone else. And so I think that's the tough thing when you get into planning things. Um, you've got a lot of people involved. You've got a lot of different interests uh, is that you have to accept the fact that your policies cannot be individually based. They have to be, um, event based. They have to be, you know, organizationally based. And you know that there are no answers you can have or give that will, um, satisfy everyone. And it, it's, it's a tough spot to be in. It's crazy because, I mean, really, when you think about it, we're, we're two years into this and we still don't have all of the answers. I mean, where I'm at in Ontario, Canada, we're still back under restrictions. You know, restaurants got opened up for a few weeks and then they all got closed again and event spaces got opened up and sporting events and all that sort of stuff. And then they locked it all down again. And so it's, it feels like it's a, a constantly moving target Two years later, yeah. we still haven't figured it out. So to, I mean, you got to have grace for anybody that was trying to make decisions in the beginning when it all started, because like, you know, you said you can't go to your parents or your grandparents and ask about it. I mean, geez, the presidents and prime ministers and world leaders couldn't figure it out when, when everything was unfolding. So, yeah, that, that was probably the weird part for me was sometimes uh, that, that sense that people couldn't look at any context like there was no context that was greater than them as an individual mm -hmm. and that was a little baffling to me because i was thinking like okay they just canceled the basketball season college football you know all these different things and i'm thinking you know they don't do those things lightly yep you know when have they and, ever done it Right, right. It's like, you know, you start talking about billions of dollars in advertising and venues and, and all these different things. And I'm like, but somehow I'm supposed to continue on like nothing happened. <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, well, you know, again, I, I, I won't say it wasn't frustrating, but at the same time, I, I couldn't expect that people had any frame of reference yep. for it. And, uh, and I always, you know, one thing I always like to say when, when I talk about the frustrating part is that it wasn't everyone. There, there were calls that came in, um, people having the same sentiment that you shared, where it was like, look, man, I, I get you in an impossible situation, um, you know, to stay encouraged, you know, whatever. And so there was positive vibes coming my way and phone calls that, that people gave or sometimes just a simple text message or something and, and just, you know, a word of encouragement. So I always like to give credit to those people because sometimes, you know, it's easy to focus on the, the frustrating moments. Yep. And um, I never want that to be the only thing that I talk about and, and not give credit to all of those who have been supportive and, and things over, over that same period of time. Absolutely. So you've had many successful years as the promoter of what is literally the largest voiceover conference of its kind. And I think one way that you know an event is great is because it seems easy and flawless to those who are in attendance, <laughs> which for anyone who's ever been a part of something like this behind the scenes, we know that there is a monumental effort required to pull that off. So how did you make it happen? How do you make it happen? Uh Wow. Um, I'm always a little conflicted on that one because I, I feel like I've been so fortunate to have people who bought into the ideas of the conference and were willing to sincerely 
put themselves out there to to help make it all possible. Um, I, I still remember the first year of just trying to put it all together myself. And I got to a point where I was maybe getting an hour of sleep a night or something like that. And, and I remember calling my sister up and just saying, I need help. I, I just, and she said, what do you need help with? And I was like, I don't know anything, <laughs> just anything you can help with. And um, so she, she helped me do that first time. And I still remember it like it was yesterday. I, I walked so much in that hotel that by the time the weekend was over, I had lost 10 pounds. Jeez. I mean, I never got to stop. And then even when I went up to the room, um, gotten all the notes and calls and emails and different things and collected them all for me. And there'd be all these stickies, you know, sticky notes uh, everywhere on the desk or table for me. Like, hey, you know, you need to call this person. You need to email this person. You need to update this or update that. And and so I'd be up till, you know, two o'clock or so in the morning. And then by five or, or four, I'm back up again and walking the hotel and doing different things. And it was it was just crazy. But I said all that to say that ultimately, I think it it's always been the people that were willing to support the effort and, and contribute to the success of the conference. And um, and so I don't do it by myself. I, I really don't. It's a small team. Don't get me wrong. It's very small. But uh, I think it's, it's made possible because I believe at its core, people want to get together. They, they want to connect in real life. They want to sit across from their peers and colleagues and enjoy a beer or a drink or a sandwich or something like that and just feel like they're real people, like they're real. They can laugh. They can cry. They can have a hug. You know, they can just be people for for that weekend. Even myself, I think about, you know, for a couple of years watching Ron Minitry going around with his clipboard or the last yep. VO Atlanta that I was at, you know, Christy Bowen was there with her clipboard and mm -hmm. I was always teasing her about cracking the whip on people. And But it, it's an amazing, <laughs> it takes an amazing team, all the ambassadors, right? I mean, Knowing that there was somebody in every session that I did who was just there to help me get or do whatever I needed. And then thinking right. about that times, however many sessions are going on at any given time. I mean, it takes a village, right? That's a lot of people that come together to make something oh, like yeah. that happen. It is. Even the hotel sometime who, you know, obviously they do events year round. A lot of times the staff would, would uh, comment that, man, we wish we had more groups like yours because you guys just operate like a machine like we don't like we just stand around and, and wait until somebody asks us for something because it's it's just rolling on its own and i'm like yeah it's like half the time you guys are in our way so just you know <laughs> we'll, we'll let you know if we need you uh, and 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 it works out well i mean you you just touched on this a little bit i think it, part of it the vibe of the of the conference vo atlanta has been referred to as a, a voiceover family reunion and mm -hmm. I've been to a number of them now and wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. But that doesn't happen by accident. So how do you, as the promoter, achieve that kind of atmosphere and vibe in an event? Because I've been to a lot of different events that don't even come close to capturing that kind of magic. Um, I think there are probably three things I, I would point to in that. Uh, one, as as the nephew of a since past pastor, I grew up in a in a family slash church environment. So creating an environment that is about community and family and people kind of comes naturally to me, so to speak, um, because that's what I grew up in. I'm the last of 11 kids. So I was always around a lot of people type of thing. I think the second one is that I'm not and, and in the booth voice actor or anything like that. So for me, when I plan the event, I start off by planning for people getting together who happen to be in the voiceover community versus being a voice actor or, you know, in the business of uh, voiceover and then trying to extend my services into doing an event. So it's just a slightly different angle. There's nothing wrong with the other one, but I think I start off thinking about how to bring people together and create opportunities for them to connect with other people versus just looking at it in terms of, okay, we're going to have all these classes. We're going to get all these people. We're going to throw around all these names and titles and all this other stuff like that. And so, so that's, that's the other thing for me is just, I, I plan a people event for the voiceover community. <laughs> that's, that's how I always like to say it. 
Uh, and the third thing is just, it just goes back to creating the environment. And, and I think that's how I see my role. I've, I've tried to say that all the time, which is I don't make things happen. I just strive for myself and my team to create an environment in which great things can happen. And that means, you know, handling the logistics so that when you get there, you're, you're welcomed, you know, you get your badge, you get your things. Um, it's easy to understand where things are happening and you can kind of flow in and out of sessions. Uh, even at lunch, you know, there's a point of, there are no big tables and little tables and, and you've been there, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's no signs on any table that says yep. reserved for anybody. So you're, you're just as likely to be sitting next to the, the keynote speaker as you are somebody who got started in voiceover last week. And, um, and I think little things like that matter because I don't want people to just come chasing name badges and titles and things like that and forget that everyone there, and I, and I seriously mean this, Mark, I, I've said this a hundred times, everyone at the conference is an agent, mm -hmm. everyone. Yep. And people say, what do you mean? Uh, yeah, how, how do you, how do you explain that? I said, how many times, and Mark, I'll ask you this. How many times have you given a referral to someone? All the time I'm making referrals. All the time. All the time. But you're not officially an agent, are you? Not even remotely close. <laughs> right. But when you give those referrals, those referrals are based on a number of things. One is that there's a confidence level of the person you're giving the referral to, because obviously you're not going to refer if you, if you don't think they can do the work. But two is, is the relationship and how you feel about that person you're giving that referral to. And so you may know of some people where they're talented, like they can do the work, but they're a pain in the butt to work with. And you're like, eh, I just, I just can't, I'm not gonna set my client up like yep. that, you know? Um, and so I stress that to people, just be a good person first. Introduce yourself, talk to people, because honestly, if they like you and they believe you're competent, they will look for opportunities for you just because they want to see you succeed. I got, I can say for myself that I actually have landed in the past two agents from VO Atlanta, and it was from the, the serendipitous moments that are created when you run into people while you're going from one session to the other. And, and just the way that the conference is laid out, you know, creating a hallway where everybody walks the hallway and you just never know who you're going to walk past or, or run into, or like you said, who you're going to sit down and, and have a meal with. And, and just some of the conversations that came completely organically as a result yep. of that, that ultimately led to things happening. And that, and that is, I think, one of the things that, that makes VO Atlanta really special. It's one of the things that I think uh, sets that conference and, and makes it unique from even some of the other events that happen in the industry. So I personally, I mean, I commend you for, for the vibe that you've created. And I think that's why people have had such a strong reaction to knowing that it's going to be the last one, because I don't think any other conference has yet figured out how to capture some of that magic that, that happens every year at VO Atlanta. Yeah. Well, the people are the magic. <laughs> it's, it's, um, uh, it, it really is. Un unlike say, you know, maybe 20 years ago when most people worked in an office and, and you had that in interaction in a workplace, um, VO, most people work independently at home. In, in their own space. And so you don't have that same water cooler kind of experience where you chat with someone or you go to lunch with someone. So when you get together, I think there's a, a really good opportunity, again, for people just to remember what it was like to sit across from people yep. <laughs> and, and just laugh. And I still remember, I think it was Dan Friedman, in one of the early years, I, I walked into the uh, dining area and they were sitting there laughing, he and a few other people. And he, he looked at me, he's like, man, I can't remember the last time I, I laughed so hard. And it, it may seem strange to some people, but to me, that one comment alone means really more to me than when someone says, oh, I, I met a new agent or something. I'm like, I get that. That's the professional side. But that laughter that you just described is something you're going to remember for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, and it's those kind of things that that stand out to me is when when you can feel like the event gave license to people to just step away from whatever they deal with when they're not there, and just be okay with just having a good time. I mean, I even think about the fact that some of my 
closest, dearest friends in the industry are people that I met at VO Atlanta, and I usually only see once a year at VO Atlanta. <laughs> but when right. we get back together again, we pick up right where we left off. I mean, yeah, we yep. talk throughout the year through, uh, you know, email or through Facebook Messenger or things like that. But when you only actually physically see each other, maybe once a year or whatever, but things just pick up like you just saw them yesterday. And and it, it is a pretty special thing. So, you know, something else that makes VO Atlanta special is there's literally something for everyone in every sense of the expression, from the newest of new talent to the most seasoned professional, every <laughs> genre of voice acting, every different skill level. What does it take to build that kind of a program? A, a lot of Red Bull. <laughs> Are they an uh, official sponsor? Maybe they should be. <laughs> no, uh, not really. I think a lot of it. I, I think it, the, the program evolves over time. And some of it just stems from, you know, having enough confidence in what you're doing to, to stick with it and gain the trust of the community. Uh you know, it wasn't all rosy when I started. There was a lot of apprehension about, you know, this new guy coming on the scene that uh, wasn't a voice actor in, in the traditional sense. And, you know, here he's trying to come and do an event in a space where there were already several <laughs> other events that happened. So fortunately, I, I, you know, was able to gain trust from some people um, early on. And um, they, they helped lay that groundwork in the beginning and then you know i just was able to to build on that and, and those relationships and things and and then people would would invite other people and speakers you know are specifically like that where i may never reach them directly but if someone they know attended the conference and had a great time then all of a sudden you know they reach out to me and say hey you know this person was telling me they had a great time at conference um, i'd be interested in coming next year and so you you build on things like that. And so I think over time, it's, it's just mostly sticking with it, being clear about who you are and what your event's about and giving people the opportunity to experience it um, with no pressure. You know, I mean, if you if you want to come and be a part, great. You know, there's there's nobody going to force you to be there. <laughs> If you're going to succeed in voiceover in 2022 and beyond, one of the things that you're going to have to know how to do is market yourself. You can sign up for casting sites and you can get some audition opportunities from there. You can go out and get yourself some agents and you're going to get yourself some opportunities from there. But if you really want to build a successful business for the long term, you are going to have to know how to market yourself. You're going to have to know how to get out there and find your own clients. And that is something that I can help you with. That is what the Vopreneur brand is all about. This is your guide through the business of voiceover. I'm here to teach you the business and marketing side of the business. And I do that through a lot of different channels, including this podcast. Of course, I have a YouTube channel as well. But I also offer various and assorted coaching resources, including video courses and private one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you want help with the business and marketing side of voiceover, let me help you. Visit my website at markscottcoaching.com. You can see the different offerings that are available when you click on the shop button. You can also schedule a 15-minute consult with me and we can talk about your specific needs and how I can best serve you. Visit my website, markscottcoaching.com. That's M-A-R-C-S-C-O-T-T, coaching.com. Now, back to our show. Let's talk about attendee strategy because it is a huge program. There's a ton going on, something for everyone, something for every genre. It really can kind of feel like drinking from the fire hose. It's like walking into your favorite store and wanting to throw one of everything in your cart because you simply can't choose or, or decide. So what advice do you have for an attendee who wants to get the most out of their conference weekend? Okay. Um, what I've developed as a response to that over the years is, is to think about it like uh, – getting a college course catalog in the mail, you know, um, or getting a PDF for one. There are a lot of courses that a school will offer. Do you ever feel like you need to attend all of those classes in that catalog? Most people say, uh, no. I said, well, which ones do you take? Well, I just take the ones I need to take to, to get my degree. I said, okay. So you first identify why you're why you're there and what your aim is. And then you build your curriculum around that. 
and where there's opportunities, you pick a few electives to explore something that maybe you never thought about before. And so I tell people to, to, to approach the conference somewhat the same way. If you want to be, um, say, commercial VO, okay, you look at that track. You know, we break down things in that, in that way. So you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to fill up the majority of my schedule with things from the commercial VO track. And then in those slots where it's not something happening in that area that, that I'm wanting to commit to, maybe I'll venture in and learn about promo or I'll learn about imaging or I'll learn about animation or whatever else it is. I usually recommend they, they take at least one or two of the business classes as well. So, so that's how I tell them to approach it is to not think about it in terms of the, everything being for you. It's not. You're not going to attend everything. It's impossible for you to take everything. So, you know, when people say, I feel like I'm missing something, I go, yeah, you are. But you're not supposed to take everything. So, so yes, you're, you're missing something. But the most important thing is that you get the things that you need or are interested in and things like that. And that's the nice part is you're not locked into a session unless it's one of the workshops. Um, you can go in a session, sit in there for a little while. If it doesn't tickle your fancy or whatever, you can go sit on another one and um, make the most of it. Now, you mentioned about the, the differences in the workshops. Give us a brief description for those that maybe are attending for the first time. You've got breakouts. You've got X sessions. You've got panels. Just kind of give us a rundown of what's what for somebody who maybe hasn't been before. Okay. Well, from, from the easiest to, to the more descriptive, uh, a, a panel is just a type of breakout where there are multiple uh, people or guests in, involved in presenting a, a given topic or subject. Um, it allows more room for people to ask questions and a little more engagement like that without there being one uh, key speaker and singular topic in, in the traditional sense. Breakouts are broken down um, where there is a specific speaker, a specific topic in a specific track. So if it's business, you know, maybe they're presenting on you know, how, how to manage clients or how to get new clients or something like that. And then all their session is about that. There's still room usually for the questions and things along that line. And it's at a generally high level because the sessions run an hour. So it's not really possible for the presenter to dive deep on individual level because there may be 40 people in there. There may be 80 people. There could be 120 people in there. Um, so naturally the, the presenter can't work with everyone. Then you go on to X sessions and X sessions are limited to no more than 12 people and they last three hours. So you, you've got a session automatically that's three times longer than a normal breakout with just 12 people at max. And that's the session where it's designed to dive deeper into more individualized uh, training and, and attention given to the individual from the, the presenter at that point. And in many cases, uh, those relationships extend well beyond the class. Most of the presenters invite people to follow up with them. They get their information. Some people like, uh, say, Cliff Zellman, you know, he, he routinely, rather, asks for a list of people who are signed up for his session because he'll contact them ahead of time and say, hey, I saw you you're signed up for my workshop. You know, send me over your information, your um, demo or whatever you have. Um, he'll ask them certain things so that he can even customize the session more because he knows they're in the session and he's looked at their website and he's done different things. And then he'll record them in his workshop. And then in many cases, he'll go back afterwards and help them with editing whatever they recorded and, and give them things like that way beyond the scope of just the three hours. But that's that's how he is. Yep. And he wants people to get something out of his session. And I think that's the most beautiful thing of it is when you see presenters at conference, it's not just that they're a good resource in, in, the, in the most traditional professional sense. It's that they are people who truly care about the outcome of what they share with you. Yeah. And I think, yeah, and, that's, and I think that's the, that's the most unique part of it for me, at least. I love that. So I know that I know we're supposed to focus because it really is easy to want to eat everything at the buffet table. But yep. I know also in the past, there's been a virtual component to the conference. So let's say that you were following a particular track in person 
and maybe there were a couple of sessions that you weren't able to attend. Is there going to be that virtual component for folks either who can't come at all or who were there but maybe missed a session or a couple of sessions that they really wanted to be in? Is there going to be a way for them to check in with those later? Yes. So, um, of course, in 21, we did the conference completely virtual, which <laughs> in and of itself was a... Uh, <laughs> An endeavor. I bet. <laughs> uh, but we learned a lot from it, and we got through it. I mean, that was a full seven days. So there was there was definitely a lot happening there. So there is a virtual component to the conference, and it generally is a, a virtual representation of what's happening in person. Uh, there'll be someone at the computer there. Um, it'll be in a Zoom session, much like it was during our virtual conference. Uh, someone will monitor the chat room. So if there's questions, you know, we can still pass those along to the presenter and things like that. So, so yes, they'll have that. The sessions are recorded and um, they'll be made available after the fact. So if someone doesn't attend, and that's the other nice thing is you can take the things that are most relevant to you in person while you're there and the sessions you didn't get to, or maybe you were in a workshop and missed or something, you can go back and watch those uh, after the conference is over. Yeah, which is always nice. It's nice to be able to go back and, and have that opportunity to revisit. And lots of times you, you watch a session the second time and you're going to get a whole new set of information from it, right? You're, you're, you're taking, adding to your notes from what you, what you did the first time. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> is there anything new in store for the 2022 version of the conference? Anything that you can tell us about? Is there anything new? Uh... We have a vaccine mandate, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> I'm good. I was going to say that probably was another one of those very easy but yet difficult at the same time decisions would be my guess. Yeah, it, it's such a weird one. Um, I mean, it's, it's only challenging to the extent that different people have different views on it. Yep. But it's easy to the extent that if something I can do can preserve the health and well-being of, of those who, who trust their time, you know, with me. Um, then I'm going to go that route. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, I have to balance that out on, you know, how we implement things. But something like the being vaccinated part, it's, it's just, you know, that's that's like our baseline. Yep. <laughs> um, and, you know, a couple of people have given me some grief about it, but it, it is what it is. And again, you, you have to make policy based on the overall event, not on, oh, you got a doctor's note. Oh, you already had COVID and you think you, you're you good. So, no, I, I can't do it that way because if you're sitting at lunch with someone or in a session with someone, you should feel confident that at a minimum they've gotten the vaccines. You know, they've, they've gotten the vaccinations and you can feel reasonably safe and in, in being around them, you know, to the extent that anybody is safe anywhere, right? You know, I, I think about, what happened with Sovis with the Voice Arts Awards this year. And a lot of voice actors went and a lot of voice actors came back with COVID and it ended up being, I guess, kind of a, a spreader event. And I don't blame you for not wanting to have any part of that or at least doing everything that you can reasonably do within your power to try to protect people. And, you know, hopefully we're at a different stage of the pandemic by the end of March and all of that. But you've still got to do what you've got to do. And at the end of the day, no matter what you do, somebody's always going to be ticked off. So you, you know, you kind of have to just accept that as part of the decision-making yes. process and move on with it. Right. It is. Yeah. Again, there's, there's not always a, a right answer. You can only make the, the best answer you can given what you know at that moment. And, <laughs> and so even now, I mean, you know, we're 60 plus days out at, at you know, the time of this this recording, but um, about 30 days out is when I'll have the, I'll issue the official on the ground policy um, of, of what things look like. The, the vaccinations are standard. I mean, yep. when they register, they have to check off that part. But as far as the, the final policies of mask and vaccination, rather, you know, boosters, not boosters, you know, all these different things, yep. um, I'll take a look at it. Because I feel like, you know, by that time, there there probably be totally different guidance than there is today. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> everything seems to be changing so quickly that it makes it hard to keep up anyway. But It does. And and if I say something now and then, you know, three weeks later something changes and then I go up to issue a, a 
retraction and a yep. new a new policy, then you know you, you frustrate people too because they're like, well, you know, you told us back in January that it was going to be this, and I'm like, I know, but the policies and recommendations changed, and uh, that's that's probably the thing as an event planner you. You never plan on having to pay so much attention to local, state, regional, yep. federal <laughs> uh, guidance. On, that seems on to be a, changing on just about a daily basis lately as well, too, which makes it that much more challenging. I, I don't yeah, envy that absolutely. position at all. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the people who signed up, I was talking to someone recently about it, and they said, I said, look, you know, the, the people who want to be there and have decided to sign up to be there, they're going to do whatever, you know, so it doesn't matter if you say, hey, wear a mask. They're going to say, hey, you know what, if wearing a mask is, is what I need to do to be there and, and enjoy my time with, with my colleagues from around the world, then it's the least of my issues. <laughs> I was going to say, if that's the, if that's the worst thing that, that somebody's got to do, that's not so bad. Yeah. So, so I know that each year the conference has a theme, and this year you've gone with Resolve. What does that mean for you? Why, how did you land on Resolve for the theme this year? Oh wow! Yeah, there were there were a few words in competition this this, this for this one. Um, yeah, everything from redeem to whatever. I could see um, redeem. I, I that would not have been a surprising one. No, um, I, I think I went with with resolve in the end, partly because I think given the event of the last, I mean the the events of the last couple of years, we all. Have, have many thoughts and about how we go forward with our lives. And I know resolve is, you know, kind of people make resolutions like at, you know, the end of the year or the new, start of a new year and things like that. But I, I used resolve because, I mean, you have to resolve within yourself that you're going to do something to move forward. Mm-hmm. It, it's done. It's decided. You're, you're not going to settle. You're not going to give up or give in. Um, it's, it's not that it's going to be easy, but it's just, you know, I'm going to resolve to, to train more. I'm going to resolve to do things better going forward. And, and I think coming out of COVID or, or whatever milestones we pass with that, I think your resolve just has to be there. Your, your commitment to self-improvement, uh, your commitment to, to being a better person, uh, things like that. And, you just have to go with it. And, and so when I looked up the definition for the term and everything, I, I think it just um, it just kind of stuck for me. And, and so that's what I went with. I think it's a great word. And I think it is very fitting in the times that we are in right now. And I'm sure that it's going to be interesting to see how that theme unfolds over the course of the weekend with different speakers incorporating that concept into the, the sessions that they're presenting as well. So Yeah, and then... And just for the record, a, a part of the official definition from the dictionary thing online is to decide firmly on a course of action. I like that. Or a firm determination to do something. Nice. Yeah, I think it's a good <laughs> word. I think, I think it's a very appropriate word. I think it's going to be a good one. You and I have had a lot of conversations over the years about the conference and business and business in general And I think that we've always found a common bond in the theme of entrepreneurship. And I think what I really like is you mentioned you're not an in-the-booth voice actor. So you're you're looking at this from a a different perspective than what in-the-booth voice actors do. So what advice do you or can you offer to particularly to talent who don't yet see themselves as anything as a performer? So they they haven't fully embraced the entrepreneurial side and, and spirit that comes along with the voiceover industry. Yeah, that's um, you know, that's always an interesting part of that. Um, observing things over the years with with the conference, I'd always notice that the performance related sessions, you know, acting, commercial, whatever, would fill up really quick. But the business ones always lag behind. Like the business sessions are always the last to to really get any attention, and it seems more like the sessions of of last resort. Like I'll I'll take one because everything else is full. Yeah. The the irony of that is that when I'm sitting in those some of those very sessions that people have flocked to, when it gets to the Q&A or, or the panels, guess what the questions tend to involve most? Business. <laughs> and, and I always found it a little bit uh, confusing that people would randomly 
seek advice in, in a group of hundreds or a panel discussion with, with their business specific questions. But then when they'd have the opportunity to take a business focused class that offered them specific instructions on business or maybe a workshop that could spend even more time delving into specific business things, they shot away from those. And so when people are new, I remember when I you know, would have classes here in the Atlanta area, I would go in before introducing my speaker and I would, I would kind of jokingly say, okay, so uh, who's here for the small business training? And they would look around all confused, like, well, what do you mean? I said, oh, 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 I meant who's here for the, the voice, intro to voiceover training? And all the hands would go up. And I'd look at them and smile a little bit and I'd say, you know, I just asked you the same question twice. <laughs> And most wouldn't, it would go right over their head. Yeah. And, but they would slowly, it would slowly sink in because I'd, I'd say, you know, when, when you want to be a voice actor, you're really saying, I want to be a small business owner. Yeah. And what that means is not just learning what to do in the booth, but so much of your work is actually done outside of the booth. I had the opportunity, I mean, before 2020 conference ended up ultimately getting canceled, I was working as the team lead on the business and marketing track. And there were, I mean, there were a hundred sessions that were submitted and so many really, really, really good ones. And as I was going through all of those sessions and then sharing my thoughts with you and Christy and, you know, I, I think this would be a really good one for the track and all this sort of stuff. I know there was a part of me that was thinking like, people need this more than they probably know. And I hope that if we give them the opportunity to attend it, that they will attend it. Ultimately, that didn't happen. But I will give the same advice now, which is there are so many great sessions that are going to be offered in that track. And you're right. Often it is the last thing that people think about, but you can be the greatest in booth performer in the world. But if you don't know how to go out and find clients, it doesn't mean as much. So don't ignore yeah. those sessions that are there and the people that are willing to, to teach you how to grow that side of what it is that you're trying to do, because it really is important. Yeah, I do stress, I, I try to really encourage people to just make it a point of, if you're going to take a bunch of workshops, make one of them business. Uh, if you're going to all these different panels and, and things, in, you know, our main days are the Friday and Saturday. And so you've got like a morning and afternoon and then a, another morning and an afternoon. I suggest take one business session in, in at least half, you know, whatever quarter of those days. So in the morning on Friday, take one business session. Cause you got three, like three things that happen, three hours of, of stuff you can choose from there. Make one of them a business, you know, in that second half of the day, make one of them a business in that first half of Saturday, make one of them a business. So even if you don't get to doing all four, just make it a point to, to to fit them in there somewhere, even if you just do one a day, but make it a point to take something, business, marketing, whatever it is, um, outside of the booth focused training so that all of your time isn't spent just trying to read a script. If you turn around and you're generally asking everybody on Facebook how much to charge for a 60 second spot that's going to run locally in a, in a you know small market. So for people who are interested in the conference, who want to be able to look at the schedule, see what's available, maybe look at some workshops, if they haven't registered yet, get registered. Uh, tell us where we have to go to, to make that happen. Well, they can go to voatlanta.me. Um, there's a big link right there on the, the main page that they come to that'll link them into the conference. And uh, there's an agenda there. There's information about the conference. There's information about hotels and you know, travel, things like that. Uh, we, you know, through any number of reasons, we don't have as many hotel rooms available as we have in the past. I think there's some other large event happening in the Atlanta area. So I've encouraged people to register as soon as they can. Um, you know, if the rooms are out at the main property, we do have some overflow rooms at a property right across the street and uh, they can book there. But, um, those, those are filling up and, you know, just don't put it off because, you know, I know it seems like, oh, you know, I'm still deciding, <laughs> but the clock just keeps on ticking. So they just go to voatlanta.me and, uh, you know, get signed up and make it happen and make their plans, uh, get everything taken care of, get ready to come, have a good time.
So the conference happening March 31st to April 3rd. Like you said, don't wait because you want to, I mean, as much as possible it is, I think it's ideal to get into the main hotel and be able to be there. And that's where a lot of those, you know, serendipitous moments of running into people in the hallways and all that sort of stuff, that's where that happens. And it's a little harder if you're at an offsite hotel. So register soon, get your room, get your schedule, spend some time thinking strategically about what you want to, uh, what, what, what is your objective for the conference? What are you going to learn so that you can map out your your schedule ahead of time, but just go knowing that you are going to learn a ton and that you are going to have so much fun. And uh, I don't think anybody that's ever gone has regretted their decision to make the investment and go do it. So Gerald, I, I'm so grateful to you for the, I guess the 10 years basically that you've been putting this event on and, and given us the opportunity to have that VO family reunion and and for the legacy that you've created in that conference, because I really do think that part of it, too, is it has become a measuring stick for some of the other events that take place. And, and it's what people look to as a as a model of, of how to create excellence in an event in the industry. And so I'm, I'm grateful to you for that. Well, Mark, I appreciate that. Um, there is one thing I, I would like to add in, and, and I think it's always important in, in terms of people going to whether it's VO Atlanta um, or any of the other events that happen, is to understand that none of these events, none of your private coaching or group coaching or anything will make something happen for you. They, they're simply there to, to better equip you with the knowledge and information you need to, to go forward. But ultimately, you have to put in the work yeah. to, to make that thing happen. Um, I would like to borrow the line from Home Depot that says, you can do it. We can help. Yes. Because that's really what it comes down to. You know, I used to have people ask, well, what is going to be my ROI out of attending the conference? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, that's really up to you. Yes. Because you're not coming to VO Atlanta to get clients. You're coming there to hopefully gain the knowledge and information necessary to, one, build or establish some, some relationships with other people in the community that help you along the way. Build on your network, your personal and professional network of people that you know in the community. And maybe just have some new ideas or approaches that you can take back and implement um, once you're back home. But the real work and the real value of the conference is not what happens in Atlanta. It's what happens back on your street <laughs> where you live in your house um, and in your studio. Because if you don't use any of the stuff, that's, that's really your part of it. Um, I always say, you know, the guy at Home Depot does not come fix the sink in your bathroom. Yep. But he can advise you on here's some options, you know, related to, to updating your sink in your bathroom. But you have to go home and do the work. Absolutely. So true. And it is one of those things where, look, it's an investment to get there. If you've got to pay for your registration, pay for a hotel, pay for a flight, all that sort of stuff, why would you not do everything possible to get the return out of it? And and there's no excuse. If you attend and you take your notes and you pay attention and you really, you know, you get out of the conference what you put into it. If you go and you do that and you come home and nothing happens, what a shame because you come home from that event equipped with everything that you need to level up, even if it's only one level up, but you do come home with everything you need to, to level up if you do the work. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it takes time. It's farming, man. You know, yep. it's, it's absolutely, like, you know, it's, it's like, there's a constant cycle of, of what you're doing. So, like sometimes you ever hear people say, Oh, well, things are really slow right now. So I think I'm gonna take a break. And you're like, like that doesn't even make sense the more you think about it, because if you're slow right now, that means you should be marketing, you should be strategizing, you should be taking advantage of, of this slower time to do the things that when you're busy, you can't do. Yep, 100%. <laughs> you know, and, and so when people just say, well, I'm going to take a break because it's slow, it's, it's a little, it, it, it creates a weird dynamic because they're going to be slow a long time because they're not putting anything in the pipeline. Yeah. And, and it's so, very backwards thinking. So it is, but it's an easy thing to fall into. Yep. And, and yep. so um, it's, it's one of those things that I think I've come to appreciate in, in working with the community is that there's, there's very little commonality across the, the entire community. Um, you have some voice actors who 
are doing very well for themselves and they're not even out of high school. You have some voice actors who um, are retired from all sorts of professional careers. You have everyone in the middle somewhere, you know, somewhere yep. along that spectrum. And so there's no one thing. And when they, they all bring something unique to the table, they all bring something different. They have their different stages of life. Uh, one person might be trying to figure out how to make a living to, to feed themselves daily. And the other person might be retired from something and they're just looking to create some vacation money, <laughs> you know, yep. to take their next trip yep. uh, type of thing. But that's the beauty of it as well, is that you really do get a chance to meet so many people from so many different backgrounds from all around the world. We have people, I was looking this morning, there's someone in person from South Korea, Japan, Switzerland, <laughs> Germany. It's crazy. Uh, and that's just a few of the places. And, uh, even Alaska. <laughs> so. That's a long flight coming in from places like South Korea. So that that's incredible. I mean, but that's a testament to the event itself too. So I yeah, mean, yeah. Those, those are humbling things when you see that people, um, would, would put that amount of time and energy yeah. and resources behind, behind the effort to, to be here with us for a few days. And they literally have traveled from the other side of the globe. It's crazy to do it. It's like, it, it, it makes the idea of getting up early or staying up late, you know, not seem as, as tough. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Like, yeah. It's so it's awesome. March 31st to April 3rd, 2022, in person and virtual. And yep. registration is open now at voatlanta.me. So check that out. Get registered. You will not regret your trip there. Gerald, thank you so much for your time and for uh, everything that you shared with us today. And, and thank you for, you know, a decade of commitment to the industry and to the betterment of the industry as well, because we're all grateful for that. Well, I appreciate that, Mark. And big thanks to you, too, man. I mean, I know you've you've done things every year. You, uh, you've done your, your holiday stuff where you're always you know, trying to make a difference and make the holiday season special for people um, by giving out, you know, different gifts and awards and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, much, much respect for that as well, man. Keep up the good work. Thank you. If you're on the fence about going, let me encourage you, go. You will not regret it. The fact that it is the last one makes it even that much more special to be able to go there and participate but there's a few things that are going to happen. First and foremost, you are going to learn from some of the most trusted and respected people in our industry. They are all there and they are all excited to teach and they are all giving with their time and their wisdom and their knowledge. So you're going to get a first class education over the course of the conference from some of the best of the best of the best to learn from. And secondly, you are going to build relationships within the community it will probably last a lifetime. It is absolutely worth it. Are you heading to the conference? Are you going to be there? Are you listening to this episode? And is it getting you even more excited about the conference? Would you do me a favor? Tag us and let us know. You can tag VO Atlanta at VO Atlanta on Instagram. And you can tag me at Mark Scott. Share it in your stories. Let us know that you're listening and let other folks know that you're going, you're going to be there, you're ready to learn, and you're ready to build some relationships within your community. Hope this episode's been helpful for you. Start thinking about your strategy now so that you are ready to get the most out of the conference. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll catch you on the next one. The Everyday Vopreneur Podcast. Available everywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Mostly, we think. Having your voiceover demos easily playable and downloadable on your website is essential. The Voice Sam Player lets you do that across any device and browser. There are also options for adding play buttons in your email signature, tracking your listens, and even putting videos in your demo player. Sign up now at voicesam.com slash markscott and receive an instant $25 credit. For full details and to claim this offer, visit voicesam.com slash markscott. And see. And that's a wrap. Thanks for hanging in. Thanks for hanging out. Want more Vopreneur goodness? Jump online at vopreneur.com.